Yes, oh, absolutely. It's like, why not be an artist? Who cares? <laughs> if we had only had one of those motivational things that said that, that would have been really cool. Yes, ma'am. They, I was hoping to see them here. <laughs> and I must admit that I'm disappointed that I don't see them here. I actually uh, offered to take all of them to lunch, those who had sent me emails and wouldn't stop sending me emails. <laughs> um, and only one of them took me up on it, and that's because he went to the same church I do. And uh, <laughs> I think he felt he had to, but none of the others would go to lunch with me. So uh, I don't, I don't, I, I would love to hear what they thought of that suggestion. Because you, could, you, you, should, you should see artists trying to sit around and talk about learning outcomes <laughs> for a beautiful passage of music as though we're going to identify it on a spreadsheet with numbers. <laughs> Max? What, what do you believe is at stake for the proponents of the opposite side of the argument? Like the people in this Derek Wilson's position? A, din a denumission of power, uh, which is ultimately what it always comes down to. Um, it's very interesting. I read an article probably about six months ago, about the, the astounding uh, self-removal of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants from positions of power and leadership in academia. Uh, and the fact that this was unprecedented in the history of the world. That huge endowments, we're talking mostly about the Ivy League, um, huge endowments with enormous power, the ability to influence generations to come, has basically been handed over to somebody who wasn't white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male. They are now the minority in those situations, or they're a, a probably very still significant minority, but they are nevertheless not the majority anymore as they used to be. Um, that reluctance of any group of people to give up power willingly because it's good, like it's a, a higher good, uh, is something that suggests to me that my idea is quite foolish. <sighs> but nevertheless, that's never stopped an artist before. <laughs> Are we uh, encouraging our students to find a major that makes them happy? I mean, it is, is that part of what we're saying to the young people? Well, um, I think you could have another whole series of editorials on whether your major, what your major feels like when it's right for you, and what your goals might be, whether it is a connectedness to a greater um, um, world of making a difference to other people. Right. Well, actually, I think that's the, the, the secret at the heart of what you've just been saying. Um, the danger of saying, you know, choose a major that will make you happy you, follows the same utilitarian argument with all its pitfalls that we say, choose a major to make you rich. Right. Um, because... But that's not our choice. No, I, right. But I tell my... One of my favorite philosophers is Dan Dennett. And uh, Dan Dennett from Tufts University. And um, he argues that the secret to happiness is to find something larger than you are and to dedicate your life to it. And in that sense, it really, that's why I think it's as, it's as possible for an accounting major to live as a fulfilling life as they can as a ceramics major. That as long as that's your passion and you are dedicating your life to it in a selfless way rather than a selfish way, then you will find happiness. It's not the major that does it. It's how you pursue it. Thank you. Yes. Michael, I appreciated the, the hybridity that you took all the different uh, economies you're showing now. Uh, the um, social historian Herman Zeldsky wrote a book called The Culture of the Cult of Professionalism. Mm -hmm. And it's a book about the emergence of the middle class in America. And it talks, and, and I think in a lot of ways, we are the, we're the sort of the fruition, the beneficiaries yes. of this idea that somehow by virtue of acquiring education, one is entitled to a higher level of wealth than one here at here before. 
And in some, in some way, we may be thinking that at this point, we're, we may be reaching not only for illusion and maturation, but the old age of that kind of idea, that there's a middle class, mm -hmm. that there's an association between education and the acquisition of wealth. Um, I thought it was interesting in your timeline that 1991 marked the origins of capitalism and a market economy. No, 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 no. Marked the disappearance, oh, the disappearance. of command economy. Because it also coincides with uh, Linus Tovar's work and crowdsourcing and open sourcing. And what some people believe may be the, the true beginnings of the deprofessionalization of the world in terms of just being able to have open access to defining all and solving all kinds of problems right. by virtue of access to the internet. So I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but it just sort of, I, there was an absence in your talk in terms of the visioning of this thing as it relates to the middle class of which we're all part and we still have the same aspirations of somehow through acquiring some education we're gonna have a right. higher level of wealth. Let me go back a little bit further in my talk to sort of give ground to my response, that um, capitalism, which creates a middle class, the middle class is a product of capitalism itself. Uh, you, you have to have people who do the market. That's where the middle class emerges from. So prior to that, feudalism really doesn't power command economies. Th there is no such thing as a middle class as we understand the term. And so it, it is made possible, in fact, by capitalism. I'm not saying capitalism is evil or anything. Um, but there is no sustained critique of how it operates, and the middle class as we understand it today is a fiction, in my opinion. That um, what the, the mobility made possible when wealth was not so highly concentrated is now gone, and, and no one is critiquing that. The fact that uh, across all Western cultures, there, except in rare, very few cases, but particularly in America, there has been an enormous condensation of wealth and power. And it's getting smaller and smaller every day. And so it's not help, I don't, the, until that relationship changes, the one you speak of as a possibility, I don't think is possible. Because that access, uh, I mean, the internet can be turned off as it has been in multiple Middle Eastern countries tomorrow here in America if somebody really, really, really wanted it to. And so we, we don't have that power. That power doesn't, it's not, it's not embedded in us in any kind of authentic way. And so we are still in that framework. We're at the mercy of that, of that operation. And we are, we've largely been ac absent from actually making it better, making it more fair, more humane. And, and, and the dominant meme has been, it's actually a good thing all by itself. I mean, there's been four or five books published recently about the moral force of a market economy. Um, and these books are largely unchallenged, except in radical, small, left-wing <laughs> magazines and newspapers that nobody reads. <laughs> As someone who's argued for the arts uh, quite a lot during my lifetime, it's difficult sometimes to prove the value of the arts to those who have not experienced them. If your target audience are those who have not seen a great play, right. or heard Beethoven's Ninth, or seen The Night Watch, it, it's difficult sometimes because that's what inspires all of us who are artists. Yes. But if they haven't had that experience. Well, I, I will tell you a story that Sammy Keynes, who is my student undergraduate assistant, told me. She's in New York right now um, uh, at a workshop, and she was telling her Patsy Rodenberg, the very famous acting teacher in New York, um, about my talk today. She was sad she was going to miss it, but she was um, excited about it. And when Patsy heard about this talk, she was, her first response was, as you might expect out of a wonderful artist, I feel so sorry for that young man. How sad. How sad that he doesn't understand yet that the arts are a way of helping him understand the world. And he might not know it now, but he's going to need it someday. And for many of us, we don't always understand that we're going to need X knowledge or whatever it is. But the, the arts, uniformly across all of them, basically translate our lives into symbolic forms that we can assimilate, that we can make part of our being and help us make sense out of them. And, and when you think about moving moments like 
uh, weddings and funerals, times of enormous personal transition, at the center of those rituals is an art. Those arts are at work in all of those moments in our lives. So we dance and we sing and we laugh and we tell stories. And that's what we do in those moments where our lives are filled with change and chaos and sadness and joy. And we don't, we don't, people don't consciously stitch together the fact that those things are the same things that we're doing. That, that's what the arts do. And, but what we're trying to do them is on a level greater than simply this wedding.